From DLA Piper, this is the Beyond the Curve podcast. In this episode, DLA Piper's Thomas Pilkerton and Lynn Pong are joined by Quarter Home CEO Shannon Deitch to discuss ways technology and innovation will shape the housing market in coming decades. Welcome to the Beyond the Curve podcast. My name is Lin Pong. I'm a corporate and real estate attorney at DOA Piper's Baltimore office. Today, we're going to dive deeper into issues surrounding affordable housing, an issue affecting millions around the globe, as well as how technology and innovation will reshape the housing market in the coming decades. I'm excited to have Shannon Dish and Tom Pickleton join me today. Shannon is the CEO of Quarter Inc., a company that is building a platform based on blockchain technology to make home ownership more accessible and affordable to individuals and create a direct mode of real estate investment by accessing to a larger pool of equity and market. Tom is a corporate partner at DOA Piper, representing both private and public companies in connection with a variety of business and finance transactions. He also has an international practice with extensive experience throughout Europe, Asia, North America, South America, and the Middle East. My first question is for Shannon. Shannon, when we heard the growth phenomenon of the working pool, individuals who work but still struggle financially, including affording houses, our younger generation is increasingly trapped in a state of perpetual rentership, often not considering home ownership a viable option for many years. So in your opinion, what are the key factors contributing to the housing affordability crisis? Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, I think there's a handful of things that are really contributing to the issues that we see surrounding young people being able to afford houses in today's market. The average age of someone entering the housing market right now in the U.S. is about 36 years old. 40 years ago, that age was 29. So we're obviously seeing a huge, huge impact. I think it's a variety of things. House prices have continued to increase while salaries have stayed pretty stagnant. Obviously, today we see record high interest rates which are driving those prices up. But the largest hurdle that young people talk about is down payment savings. Every month they're shoveling money out to student loans, to their rent, to other financial obligations, and saving that 20% down payment is a real struggle for people. And this isn't just impacting young people. It's a disproportionate impact on minorities. We have a 30% gap in home ownership between white Americans and black Americans, and that gap isn't closing. So as we are facing these struggles, we need to come up with creative and innovative solutions in the space. And there's a lot of really interesting companies trying to tackle that problem head on. And Shannon, you and I are both based in the U.S., so it's very top of mind for us, but this is also becoming somewhat of a global problem that we've seen you on the business side, me on the legal side throughout the world. So it is something that is going to continue to affect economies, both for emerging countries, but also for established countries. So I think this is something that as we continue on through this decade, will continue to have an impact, not just the U.S., but abroad. Yeah, I think that's a really accurate point. I mean, we log on to news channels and we see articles from the UK and from England and from Australia about the affordability issue. And we're really fortunate here in the States to have fixed rate mortgages. You can get in when rates are low and it stays the same for 30 years. That's not the case in every country. A lot of countries have floating rate mortgages. So those interest rates go up and people get priced out of their house that they're currently living in. And we're going to continue to see that happen. So based on what you just discussed, give us some examples where tech has already made a substantial difference in this area. Yeah, one of my favorite things that people are trying to tackle using innovative technology. I actually met a woman on a plane a few months ago who had started a company doing 3D printing of houses, trying to make the building more affordable. So I think people are attacking it from a variety of different places using new interesting technology. There's also a lot of down payment assistance programs and affordable housing programs trying to assist that lower strata of income earners to get into properties and stay in them. Let's shift it to the investor's perspective because traditional modes of investing in real estate are burdened with high barriers to entry, like high fees, liquidity issues, and the inability to diversify effectively. So we talk about maybe tokenization offers opportunity for fractional ownership. 
Can you explain how tokenization and blockchain technology can increase accessibility to this type of real estate investing? Yeah, so like you said, tokenization is really a way to offer the opportunity to fractionally buy pieces of properties, residential properties, commercial properties. I think we're going to see it across a broad range of investment opportunities. And there's a couple of really neat things that fall out from that technology. The first being the obvious, you can have a much smaller bite size, right? You don't need to be a multimillionaire to be able to suddenly have rental properties, be able to invest in properties across the country and across the globe. It also really allows for diversification of investment. You can have a small piece of ownership in a property in Phoenix. You can have a small piece of ownership in a property in New York. You're really able to pick and choose your markets in a way that with traditional house financing, you weren't able to do. There's other really interesting things as well with the quarter model, for example, as a real estate investor, there's no longer a need for property management. So we're able to pull some more efficiency out of the system on the investor side and allow them to really realize their gains in a very unique way. And I would just add too, it opens up the ability to almost microfinance or diversify your finance at a level that hasn't historically been really achievable. So historic real estate investors in finance has largely been within REITs or in the commercial markets, sometimes agricultural, but not really residential. So I think tokenization and blockchain is something that could open the door for a broader spectrum of investing at a more micro and local level that hasn't really been seen before. And then just to note too, with these sorts of technologies in place, it is important to always think of them as new and innovative technologies, but also distinguish them from what they're not. So not every blockchain or digital asset is crypto or has ties to that piece of it. So I think from an investor standpoint, being able to take a look at each investment opportunity, weigh out what it is, what it is not, and then also thinking about the potential market and what your returns can be are all part of the puzzle. And this really is just allowing more options and will be a developing market that I think early adopters could really take advantage of now. Tom, you mentioned digital assets and potential legal issues. Can you point out some key legal implications for tokenizing real estate? Because for example, in certain jurisdictions, tokens can be considered securities. Are there any potential implications one should know? Yeah, that's right. And I think obviously having a security lawyer on deck is important in (laughs) making these analyses and discussion, but certainly in the U.S. right now, there's been a lot of activity and discussion about what digital assets are. And as a baseline, we're starting to see the SEC come out on more types of tokens being securities than not. Mm -hmm. But to the extent that it is a security, which many of these are, you take a risk if you're classifying it not as a security of having enforcement action. But if it is, then obviously you need to comply with either reporting requirements or in registration requirements. So that's part of the landscape here in the States. And then again, it's emerging and there are different outcomes in other parts of the world. So other countries throughout the Middle East, Europe, Asia, are quickly developing their own rules, regulations, protocols for how to deal with tokens and digital assets. So those are evolving and emerging very quickly. And it's important to continually monitor and update depending on where you're at, where you want to deploy a business model, and then also ensuring that you're taking a look at it from not just where it is now, but where it could end up, but also being conservative and not wanting to get to the point where you're in trouble early on and your investment goes south. I mean, we've all seen in the news the issues with, you know, I said earlier, crypto and crypto exchanges. Those are top of mind for a lot of regulators and obviously resulted in a lot of investor losses. So it is important to be mindful and have that regulatory landscape in mind as these developing technologies emerge. And I think they will be emerging more and more often, even with some of the troubles that have happened in the last year or so. Tom, so talking about the 
global scale. Can you highlight some key differences in how real estate tokenization is being approached globally by different countries, governments? Yeah, sure. So as I had noted, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, I think governments and regulators are mm -hmm. evaluating what they're doing and what makes policy sense for their particular jurisdiction. And there is right now the ability to forum shop a little bit as some jurisdictions, let's just say the Middle East is an example, in Dubai where they've established VARA, which is a body that's relatively unique, but its whole purpose is to deal with digital assets and to administer them in a more permissible way than what's occurring right now in the U.S. where, again, most of what's happening in the U.S. should be deemed a security. In other parts of the world, it may not be a security. So that has implications on the offering of those from issuers. It also has implications on just legal structure. So whether it's a contractual right or whether it's a true equity position or is it a debt position, again, it varies. That from a investor standpoint has tax implications. So that's also part of the advising that should be done. First off, who's the issuer? What is it that I'm buying? What are the tax implications of this transaction? And then of course, on the business side, what are the potential returns and the opportunity here? But all of it is emerging, Lynn, and really different countries are taking different approaches, which is interesting as an international lawyer to see unfold, but also creates challenges in providing a single answer when asked the question, what are the rules on tokens? Mm -hmm. It's not a bright line. And the nuance really is important because you don't want to get on the wrong side of a regulator or assume that what's happening in one country is just going to carry over to another. It doesn't always work that way. Great. So Shannon and Tom, looking towards the future, how do you envision the global landscape of real estate tokenization evolving over the next few years? I think from the consumer side of things, there has to be a reimagining of what home ownership really means and where the value lies. As we talk about fractionalization and tokenization of residential real estate, it requires people to remove this idea of your home being the main source of investment opportunity for you as an individual. Now you have much more financial flexibility. You can choose how much of your home you want to own. You can choose how much of it you want to fractionalize and share with the rest of the global investors of the world. So I think that's step one. On the investor side, I think it's a really exciting time to be involved in this space for a couple of reasons. It's opening the aperture to a lot more people to be able to participate in this type of investment opportunity. Today, Bob from down the street could not participate in real estate investing on a global scale. I think there's a lot of regulatory work, as Tom alluded to, to make it possible to do this on a global scale. But I think that's the future. I think that's where we're headed to. It's going to take some time to figure out all of the legal structuring and all of the regulatory implications of that. But someday in the future, I think there's a place where people can invest in real estate all over the world, just like they do in other asset classes. Yeah, and just going back to the start of our conversation where we were talking about affordable housing, the lack thereof, I think this can be part of the solution. There's obviously a lot of unique things that are being done in the area. I think it is top of mind for local politicians and the like, and we are going to start to see it addressed more frequently. But I also think that the idea of tokenization and the ability to, as Shannon alluded to, have fractional ownership can really help the process. It can really assist in that really burden and prevention of ownership via down payment and traditional mortgage and renter models. It could be another alternative and part of the path forward. I also expect to see that you won't only see it in residential, but you'll start to see it in commercial models. And that'll be a area that is gonna be, again, another alternative for investment on the commercial side as well. In addition to the traditional real estate type funds that are out there, I would expect you could see more funds that involve this sort of token and blockchain technology as part of the solution there. Yeah, I would imagine from the commercial real estate perspective, at least the smart contract can increase the efficiency in terms of property management, that would be one of the huge advantages to have as well. 
Thank you so much, Tom and Shannon, for joining us. Thanks, Lynn. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for listening to DLA Piper's Beyond the Curve podcast. All information, content, and materials contained in this podcast are for general informational purposes only. This podcast is intended to be a general overview of the subjects discussed and does not create a lawyer-client relationship. Statements and opinions are those of the individual speakers and participants and do not necessarily reflect the policies or opinions of DLI Piper LLP US. The information contained in this podcast is not and should not be used as a substitute for legal advice. No listener should act or refrain from acting with respect to any particular legal matter on the basis of this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel in the relevant jurisdiction. This podcast may qualify as lawyer advertising, requiring notice in some jurisdictions. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. DLA Piper LLP US accepts no responsibility for any actions taken or not taken as a result of this podcast. Thank you.